about when we say collectively together as a church that we love you, Jesus. It's a little bit different than when we individualize and say, I love you, Jesus. I've been married to my beautiful bride for almost 13 years, and if I've never made it a point to say I love you, then how, how does that work itself out in a relationship? take her for granted and if I don't show her that I love her by how I serve her and how I care for her, try to protect her to the best of my abilities and to say that we have a relationship with Jesus and to not say that I love you after the love that he showed us our affection, our devotion we pour out on the feet of Jesus, I wonder if Maybe this image will help you as we approach him, as we tell him how much we love him. He says in Zephaniah 3, verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save you. He will provide for you. He will protect you. He will rejoice over you. He's rejoicing over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love he will bring you a peace he will exult over you with loud singing like to have that image that as we sing and express our love to him that he is there quieting us with his love he's singing over us with loud singing how amazing is that that the God is singing over you and over me. So Father, we love you. You are so great. You are so good. We are so undeserving. So even in this moment, would you quiet us with your love? Some of us are struggling today. We have questions. We have doubts. We have concerns. We have all kinds of things that are hindering us from coming to you would you lead us in that place allow us to experience your singing over us thank you for your love together as a community of faith to make declarations to claim promises to hear from his word to catch up with one another if you're a new guest with us today allow me to introduce myself my name is Jason I'm one of the pastors here of Mission Community Church so glad to have you uh, with us to worship with us to hear from his word all of you who call Mission your church home great to see you and if you're turn, uh, tuning in online so good to have you here as well as we dig into our scripture this morning. You know, we kick off a a new series today, a seven-week series that we've entitled Famous Last Words. And, And this series is going to lead us up to Easter Sunday. Easter is late this year, April 21st. Mark it on your calendars. So this will take us all the way up until that time. And, and I'm hoping that If you're familiar with the church calendar year, uh, this Wednesday kicks off a a season that's known as Lent in the church calendar uh, within, you know, the church community, and and this takes us up to Easter Sunday, and so I hope this, these next seven weeks will really be helpful for us to reflect and to meditate, to remember all that Jesus has done for us so that when we get to Easter Sunday, we can maybe worship him with a little bit more gusto, with a little bit more uh, love and adoration for just how good he has been to us, his people, primarily for dying for our sins so that we might have life in his name. 
As I was thinking about this series, I, I was thinking about the idea of races. A couple of years ago, probably about five or seven years ago, I started getting into running various types of races. Now, I never ran before that. I, I was a soccer player growing up in high school and college, but I was a goalkeeper, so I didn't have to do too much running. And weirdly enough, I, I started getting into running about five, seven years ago. And, and I never understood when people talked about this runner's high that they experienced, but I quickly found out what this was. And, you know, started off small, running some 5Ks and, and some 10Ks, and then, then I started feeling a little bit more confident, added in some half marathons and marathons, added in some Spartan races, and then I got real bold, and I tried a couple of triathlons, and I really loved that because it was just different types of sports, biking, swimming, and running. It kind of broke up the monotony of, of doing these races. And, and for me, one of the things that helped me run these races Races is, is these mile markers that you would see along the way. It would help me to, to kind of push myself to that, that next mile, to, to kind of see how I was doing, to see how my pace was in the course of that race. And I started thinking, isn't, isn't our spiritual journey a lot like a race? I mean, Paul says it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, do you not know that in a race all Runners run, but only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. And then the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since there are fans in the heavens cheering us on, he says, let us lay aside every weight, let us lay aside every sin that so closely clings to us, and, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us with our eyes focused on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So this life, our, our spiritual journey is very much like a race. And then I started thinking, okay, so what are, the, what are the mile markers for our spiritual journey? Like, how can we tell how we're doing in our spiritual race? How can we tell how far we are in, in reaching that ultimate prize of, of Jesus and, and receiving God and being in his presence? And as I looked at these seven last sayings of Jesus, I would suggest to you that these are like seven spiritual mile markers for us in our spiritual journey. So to give you a little bit of a preview of what's to come, this, this, this first mile marker is one of forgiveness, that we, we receive God's forgiveness. And as we receive his forgiveness, this leads to mile marker number two, salvation. And that upon salvation, we are brought into a right relationship, mile marker number three with God and a right relationship with other believers, other followers of Jesus. But if you're familiar with life, if you have any experience at all, you know that, that sometimes it, it gets difficult and sometimes you experience seasons of what, you, of what you sense to be abandonment from God. Another mile marker where we start to question, are you even there, God? Are you answering my questions? And, and then there's just distress that comes up in our life with life circumstances. But as we hold on to God, as we cling to him, we experience mile marker six, triumph and victory over these things that, that hold us back. And then the greatest reward, that prize that we run after will be our reunion with God in heaven. From the time he was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning until the time he died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there are seven sayings that he cries out from the cross, sayings that he needs to say and sayings that we need to hear as we embark on this journey together. So I wonder if you'll take a walk with me. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, let's take a walk. Turn to your other neighbor and say, hey, let's, let's take a walk together. You know, before we, we hit this first mile marker, I'm actually going to jump a couple days ahead to the, the day of Jesus' resurrection. It's Resurrection Sunday. Now, this was a long day for Jesus. I mean, he woke up early in the morning. He's 
pushing that Atlas stone away. He appears to Mary Magdalene. He appears to three other women. He eventually appears to Simon. And all of a sudden, he's walking along this seven-mile journey to Emmaus with two unknown disciples. You can read about it in Luke chapter 24. And at the end of this long journey, when they end up in Emmaus, Jesus breaks bread with these disciples. These disciples actually realize that they have been with Jesus, the risen Lord, this whole time. And then this then causes them to come back to Jerusalem. So another seven miles. And let's not forget that Jesus did a little CrossFit a few days earlier. Oh, come on. That was good. I mean, that's, that's good preacher humor right there. Taking me for granted. I worked all week on that one. It's a long day for Jesus. We read in John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, that long day, Resurrection Sunday, the, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. You see, this is what fear does to us. Fear locks us in. It keeps us captive. It's not keeping us out from anything. It's, it's keeping ourselves locked in. And, and so here's Jesus who conquered sin and death. He was dead, now is alive. But the, the, the disciples are huddled in this locked room for fear of the Jews. It's interesting that some disciples walked away from Jerusalem, walked away from the presence of God to Emmaus. But then there are other disciples who are in the presence of God, but they have their hearts hearts so locked up that they might as well not even be there. Lock themselves in for fear of the Jews. And then Jesus came and, and stood among them. Like, how did he get in? The doors were locked. And so some people argue that he just kind of floated through the walls. Some people said he climbed through a back window or he just instantaneously appeared. Perhaps he, he picked the lock. It, it doesn't matter how he got in. The point is, is that grace will break in through the back door and meet you in your place of fear. There is no mountain that he won't climb up. There is no wall that he won't kick down. There is no lock that he won't pick to get to you, this is what grace is, this unmerited favor of God. And Jesus says, peace, shalom. Oh, to be in that room when he shows up. In verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his, his hands, showed them his his side, where that spear pierced him, showed him his hands. I, I want you to remember some numbers. So we, we talked about these seven sayings of Jesus, the, the disciples who traveled seven miles to, to Emmaus. That seven is representative of completion in the Bible. So it's almost like he's taking us in this complete spiritual journey. He's walking this journey. But then we come to his hands, five. It's, it's the number of grace in the Bible, five wounds, two in the hands, two in the feet, one in the side, five digits. He's showing him grace, five wounds. Here are my hands. And I wonder if when the disciples saw his hands, much like the disciples in Emmaus when he broke bread and handed the bread to the disciples, it was in that moment that, that they were enlightened, that they recognized Jesus for who he was. I wonder that when he showed the disciples in that upper locked room his hands, did they flash back to his words when those nails were being pierced into his hands. This is our first mile mark marker on our journey, a word of, of forgiveness that, that as they were driving these nails into his hands, the scripture says that Jesus cried out the first phrase, the first saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. They don't know what they're, they're doing. I think to myself, all week I've been thinking about this, what, what a generous intercession. 
I mean, there's, there's different types of prayers. There's communion when we're just talking with God all day. There's supplication when we're offering up our requests to God. But then there's intercession when we're uh, offering up the requests of others. And I think to myself, as they are nailing the nails into his hands where the soldiers are putting it through the bones so that it supports the weight of his body so he can hold himself, that, that while they were nailing the nails into his hand, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I know that when people sin against me, I say to God, they know exactly what they're doing. But to have the presence of mind to ask for forgiveness as nails are being driven through your hands. I kind of like King David's prayer, Psalm chapter 3. He says, arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you kick in the teeth of the wicked. If there is a ministry of kicking teeth and taking names, sign me up. I want some of that. But then Jesus says, no, 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 forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I don't know about you, but when someone hurts me or sins against me or does wrong against me, it, it, it actually takes me some time to forgive. Like, I need some space. I need some time to kind of think through and process it before I offer up that forgiveness. But as they are putting the nails in his hands, as they are hammering the nails in his hands, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And, and as you look at this phrase in the Greek, the way that it's actually structured, the tense that it's actually in suggests that he is uttering this prayer over and over and over. So I actually like the passion translation of this verse. It says, while they were nailing Jesus to the cross, he prayed over and over, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When they saw his hands, when they saw his wounds, did they remember what Jesus said that they remember his words. This is the first and perhaps the most famous of Jesus' last sayings on the cross. And as I think about this, I, I wonder where you've been wounded. What are the wounds that you carry? What are the scars that you have? There's this theologian, Pastor Warren Wearsby, when he's when we're talking about these last sayings of Jesus, he says these are windows into the heart of God. That these last sayings, that when you have a moment to, to share your final thoughts, these are going to let us into all that God wants us to hold on to and to cling to. These are important words. I like to say it this way, that as Jesus was performing the greatest work in heaven, he was saying the greatest words on earth. And thinking about forgiveness, I, I wonder where we've been wounded. Where have you been wounded? For Jesus, I mean, the focal point was his hands. He's showing, showing the disciples his hands, the, the holes in his hands. You see, the disciples needed to see something to believe who he was. It wasn't just enough for them to hear that Jesus had risen from the dead. They, they needed to see the holes in his hands. And so Jesus says, hey, do you, do you see my scars? Do you see my, my wounds, the, the place where they drove the spikes into my wrist? That, do you see this? And I think about this idea of scars, that, that scars really tell a story, right? It tells a story of of some pain, of some hurt that we've been through, but then how we've made it through that trial, that, that tribulation, that dark time. And, and it's interesting to me that even as he's sharing this among the disciples, he, he still has that one, that one lost sheep in mind. He's always pursuing the one that has the doubts. Can we talk about Thomas for a few minutes? Thomas. Doubting Thomas as the church refers to him. It's interesting, just like a week or two earlier, 
Thomas was right next to Jesus saying, hey, I'll go with you back into Jerusalem, even if that means I'm going to die. And yet for this one moment in his life, the church labels him as a doubter. The church has that tendency to take that one time in your life and label you for the rest of your life, doubting Thomas. John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. I mean, if we're going to call him Doubting Thomas, let's at least make it roll off the tongue a little bit either, you know, a little easier. How about Doubting Didymus? It a, has a better flow to it. The alliteration, I mean, preachers love that stuff. Doubting Didymus. And we don't know why he wasn't there. I mean, some, some pastors and theologians, I've kind of heard it said that he didn't have enough faith to be there or he was wallowing in his doubts. But is it any better to be in a locked room for fear of the Jews? I mean, is that any better? I mean, if we're going to go ahead and label people, why, why don't we label those disciples who were hiding in that upper room for fear of the Jews? What about Simon Peter? Scaredy cat Simon. Or, or Andrew, anxious Andrew, or, or nervous Nathan. How about locked door Levi? If we're going to label people. But this is my point. You see, we all have our moments. We all have our scars. We all have our doubts. We all have our denial and our dysfunction. We, we all have the sin that, that clings so closely to us. But grace not only sees our scars, he shows us his. He shows us the place of his wounds. So verse 25 of John chapter 20, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. We've seen him, Thomas. He, he's alive. But he said to them, huh, huh, no, no, unless I see him, Unless I see the mark of the nails and, and actually place my finger into the mark of the nails, the hole in his hands, I will never believe that sometimes it's a powerful experience that is greater than a powerful explanation. That we in the church, we know all the right answers, we know all the right sayings, sometimes we just need to cry out for a powerful experience of God. And this is where Thomas is. And can we blame him? I think we would all ask for the same thing. I, I need to see it to believe it. Verse 26, eight days later, sticking with numbers, so seven is the Number of completion, five is the number of grace, eight is the number for renewal, of rebirth in the Bible, of, of being born again. So when you think of the number eight, it's, it's significant of these new beginnings. So even in, in the Old Testament times, males were circumcised on the eighth day. It's the symbolic of, of being circumcised with the heart that, that King David was the eighth son of Jesse, who is the foreshadowing of the perfect and true King David. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. That eight days later, he, he didn't show up to Thomas when he said that a week earlier, when he said, no, 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 I need to see the marks in his hands. He could have appeared in that moment, but for some reason, Jesus allows him to stay in this space of uncertainty in order that his faith might be built up eight days later. I said, I need to see the holes in his hands. That sometimes God will leave us in this space of questioning, of wondering, of, of doubt, so that that, that we might create faith within ourselves as we focus in on him. I mean, have you ever had to wait? Have you ever had to wait through a diagnosis? Have you ever had to wait through your, your own doubts and your own questions? Have you ever had to wait through some sort of a custody battle or anxiety attack? Have you ever had to wait for a clear calling on your life? Have you ever had to wait? Eight days later, 
his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, still scared, disciples hiding behind dead bolted doors, still struggling. I'm in church once again. I still am struggling with this issue. I still have this problem. I'm hiding my scars. I'm not dealing with my scars. And then Jesus comes in once again. Peace. Shalom. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Hey, Thomas, I heard you wanted to see the holes in my hands. I heard you needed to see it for yourself. Put your finger here. Where? Here. Where the, the nails were. You see, they're not there anymore. That sin is not there anymore. That shame, that guilt, that addiction, it's not there anymore. In other words, the nails that once held me don't hold me anymore. Come, put your finger where the nails are. Flashback to when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here's what I want to challenge us with today or encourage us with, perhaps. When it comes to this idea of forgiveness. That forgiveness isn't pretending that it didn't happen. Forgiveness isn't forgetting. Now, fortunately, God does forget our sins, but we are just humanly incapable of forgetting sins that, that we've committed, sins that have been committed against us. Forgiveness doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It's not pretending as if it didn't happen. It's interesting to me that when I think about Jesus and his resurrected body, this glorious body of his, that he kept his scars. He kept the holes in his hand and the holes in his feet and the, the scar in his side. He's, he's perfect. He's resurrected. He kicked death in the teeth. He has risen from the dead, and yet he's kept his scars. He didn't stay dead, but he's now alive. That there's a difference when we live from a place of woundedness and, and living from a place of scars. You see, what I have the tendency to do, if I'm living from a place of woundedness, I'm trying to project that woundedness on you. But if I live from a place of scars, I'm living through experience. I'm living through wisdom. I'm living with the power of God who's delivered me from that time in my life, that sin that so easily clung against me. He said, here are my scars. It's not pretending it didn't happen because the scars are there to prove that it did. The wounds were there, but they're not currently there. We all have scars. And it's okay for us to show our scars. I mean, our scars prove to others and prove to us that, that God met us in the fire and delivered us on the other side. But sometimes with, with Christianity, we think it's all cosmetic surgery so that we become these perfect plastic people thinking that we have everything together. No, no, no. It's okay to show your scars. It's not pretending that it didn't happened. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's good to remember that, that we were once sinners separated from God. The scars are there to prove it, to cause us to remember. And so forgiving isn't pretending that it, it didn't happen, and, and forgiveness isn't pretending that it didn't hurt, because it can hurt. It can do a number on us physically, emotionally, even spiritually. That the nails may be gone, but the memory of the pain is still in that place. It's still there. It reminds us of what we had to go through and what we had to deal with. It doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. 
I mean, away with the idea, with the, the preaching, with the theology that, that the pain goes away when we offer forgiveness. The pain is still there. But though the pain remains, the, the promise remains the same, that, that the promises of God help us to, to continue to move forward in the purposes and plans that he has for us, that we can now share our wisdom and experience with others. So it's not that it didn't happen. Forgiveness is not that it doesn't hurt. Because some are chasing after a feeling of forgiveness. That sometimes when they offer forgiveness or experience forgiveness themselves, that it's going to lead to a, a lack of hurt or a lack of pain. Forgiveness isn't a feeling. Forgiveness really takes faith. It's an action as we not only ask for forgiveness, but as we receive forgiveness. And then we offer that to others who have sinned against us. You see, Jesus, as, again, they're nailing the nails into his hand. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. He is practicing the very thing that he preached. So in Matthew chapter 5, he says, you have heard it said. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's the first spiritual mile marker of our journey, forgiveness. Forgiveness. I would ask these questions of you when it, when it comes to forgiveness, when we think of the forgiveness granted to us through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Number one, have you asked for forgiveness? And not only have you asked for forgiveness, have you received forgiveness? It's one thing to ask for, it's another thing to actually receive it. Because although we're we're sometimes hard to forgive other people. And although sometimes we offer forgiveness, sometimes the most difficult person to forgive is the ones that, that we, we do the self-inflicted harm on ourselves. That we don't, we don't receive the forgiveness that has been granted to us through Jesus Christ. So have you asked God for forgiveness and have you received it? Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Second question I would ask is this, have you asked others for forgiveness and have you offered forgiveness to others? Jesus says, Matthew chapter 6, for if you forgive others their trespasses, their sins, how they wronged you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That is one of the most scariest verses in the entire Bible. That if I don't offer forgiveness, my Father won't give me forgiveness. It's almost to say that there is no sin so great that we ought not forgive when we realize the greatness of our sin that God forgave in Jesus. That there is no sin so great that we ought not forgive when we realize just how great our sin was that God forgave in Christ Jesus. For me, the hardest person to forgive was my own father. He abandoned me and my brother and sister. He abused my mom physically, emotionally, even spiritually, I would suggest, because here she is left crying out to God, why do you have me in this situation? And so she's struggling with some of her spiritual scars in those moments. He goes off and is consumed with alcohol, in and out of jail, registered sex offender, to date, he was the hardest person for me to forgive. 
but there is no sin so great that we ought not forgive when we realize the greatness of our own sin that God gives to us through Jesus Christ. It's not saying that it didn't happen. It's not saying that it didn't hurt. There are no more nails. The nails are gone. The the scars remain to remind us of, of the power of God when he reveals his glory to the disciples. Here are my scars. Here is the scar in my side. Put your hand here, Thomas, and feel for yourself. You are forgiven. The sin that once held me to the cross no longer holds me. The sin that held you to the cross no longer holds you. Now let it go. In the great words of the theologian Elsa, let it go. You know, the hardest mile in a marathon is the first one. So as a, as a runner, what you want to do in a race is try to do what's called negative splits. And so what that means is that, that each mile you get just a little bit faster than the mile before. And so mile one goes, and when you get to mile two, you want to run mile two just a little bit faster than mile one. And then mile three, you want to run just a little bit faster than mile two. But this is what happens when you get all geared up for a marathon, that you've done months and months of training. You're feeling good. You've eaten healthy, it's race day morning, it's early, you're, you're hydrated, you're excited, you're, you're, you're cooped up in this corral like a caged animal, you just want to run, and, and that gun goes off, and the hardest thing about a marathon is not to bolt out of the gate as fast as you can, because there are people that are running by you, and you know for a fact that they shouldn't be running by you, but if you don't set yourself in the pace of grace, You will only hurt yourself in the end. This first mile on our spiritual journey is perhaps the most important. Set yourself on the right pace. Ask for forgiveness. Receive his forgiveness. And then offer it up others. I'm going to ask every head bowed and every eye closed. Fathers, we start off this, this race for the next seven weeks. Uh, would you allow us to experience you powerfully? sin against the creator of the universe. And yet you offer forgiveness to us through the shedding of your son's blood. That we cannot receive salvation, we cannot receive right relationship with you until we've received this gift of forgiveness. So would you help us to experience you? Not just let it be an explanation, but an actual tangible experience of you. As your heads are continue to be bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask if you've ever received that gift. Have you asked for forgiveness and have you actually received it? If you haven't, would you just raise your hand so that I can pray for you? And and I want to give you an opportunity to actually receive that forgiveness today. To receive the right relationship that we can have with God the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son who died for your sins. That there's nothing that we can do to earn our way back into a right relationship with God. It is by grace through faith that we are saved as we place our faith and trust in Jesus on the finished work on the cross, that there are no more nails. If that's you today and you want to receive him, receive that forgiveness, would you raise your hand today so I can pray for you? And then Christian, it's time to lay that sin at the foot of the cross. 
that sin that clings so closely, let us run with endurance the race that is before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. If you want to lay that sin down, would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? That sin that you can't forgive yourself for, or perhaps there's a sin that you're trying to, to forgive others of, would you raise your hand and I'll pray for you in that way? I see you in the back. I see you down here, buddy. I see you in the back. Pray something like this, Father, I am asking for your forgiveness. And I am receiving it. Help me to no longer live in the shame or the guilt of that sin, but I lay that before you at the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna enter into a time of communion together as a, as a community of faith. And a couple of things I want us to think about as we come to the table together that again as, as Jesus is on the road to Emmaus talking to these disciples he's explaining the whole scriptures to them but they're blinded to who they are talking to they don't recognize Jesus but if you read in Luke chapter 24 they get to a place they, they end up in Emmaus they actually ask Jesus hey don't don't leave we actually there's something about you that we want to get to know more. We, we want to ask you a whole bunch of questions. And, and so Jesus, he, again, he, he, he just marches in. He, he makes himself at home. Grace will do that. He'll just show up. And, and he starts breaking bread. And they take communion together. And the, the scriptures say that as, they, as Jesus took the bread and broke it and handed it to these two disciples, that their eyes were opened. And so perhaps it was they actually saw the holes in his hands as he's handing the bread to these two disciples. The Old Testament prophet says that by his stripes we are healed, that, that as we break the body of Jesus as representative of his, his body that was broken for us, the, the whips that tore off his flesh and and Paul even suggests that, that some of us, some of you in the Corinthian church, you're, you're actually suffering sickness and disease because you're, you're not coming to this table in an appropriate manner. So there, there is something in the taking of his bread and the taking of his body that is experiential. And, and I don't know exactly all that that means other than he wants us to remember, he wants us to experience him that my broken body was broken for you. And then as we come to the cup, the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And so as they're driving the nails into his hands and his blood is staining that cross, this is the remission of our sins. That, that it was our nails that put him there. Not that it didn't happen. It's not that it didn't hurt. It's, it's causing us to remember the greatness of our sin and yet the forgiveness that we receive in Jesus Christ. And that we no longer have to remain in that place. And so as you come to the table this morning, what I would ask is, is we don't, we don't limit communion to membership. We just simply ask if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith and trust in him for salvation, then you are welcome to participate in communion with us. That you spend some time reflecting on, on just your own sin. Asking God for forgiveness and then receiving that forgiveness. And may that be the motivation you need to offer forgiveness to someone else that has wronged you, that has harmed you, because there is no sin so great that we ought not forgive when we realize just how great our sin was that God forgave in Jesus. So let's take some time in communion this morning. As you come up to the table, there's also a bunch of nails. 
And as we enter into the season of Lent, maybe you just taking a nail and placing it somewhere that you'll see it every day is just a reminder that, that yes, your, your sin nailed Jesus to the cross, but his, those nails are no longer in his hands. Those nails are no longer in his feet. They are left on the cross to remind yourself of that. 